Hey, everybody, and welcome to this. This is the fourth installment of our Psychology of Lockdown. Today, George and I are going to be talking about the shame-based identity. I can't wait to get into this one. Uh, shaming and the feeling of shame is such a huge part of what we're dealing with. I think any of us that uh, don't want to wear the mask or don't want uh, you know, question the lockdown narrative or even just question the, the corporate government narratives in general often confront people that want to inflict shame upon us uh, as we're having our conversations. We simply have a difference of opinion. And the next thing you know, you know, people are, are telling us that we're hurting everybody else, that our personal health care decisions are going to cause uh, mayhem in the community, that we don't care about other people. Uh, I've seen articles written in, in uh, mainstream news where they're starting to try to call people who don't want to wear masks, for example, narcissists or lacking of empathy, all of this, these attacks that are coming at us. And so much of this comes from this concept of the shame-based identity. So uh, I'll let George take it away, um, but I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. George, what are you thinking? Well, you know, you nailed it. Again, we're dealing with the traits of mystification. Uh -huh. The mismanagement of socialization, the mismanage of interpersonal relations and balanced responses in interpersonal settings. In stressful times, people find it very hard to offer these balanced responses because fear has a very powerful effect on all of us, not just part of us, all of us. Fear is at the root of mm -hmm. people's responses. So naturally, if everything is fear-driven, we're not seeing a lot of logic. There's a lot of irrationality, <clears throat> pardon me, in people who are responding to people out there today in on planet COVID. I've, I've developed a new term called planet COVID because there seems to be an exclusive set of behaviors on this planet. And when we begin to observe it, what we're noticing, again, um, we talked in previous episodes about magical thinking, how people deal, refer to the lockdowns, how they speak to others about their experiences right. with the lockdown. Seldom is it concrete information. We're still dealing with, you know, childlike references. We've got to get to the heart of the matter. We need to get to the facts. So magical, we started with that. We went to the people who are yearning for fulfillment, if only. We could just get out of this. If only things would just go back to normal. If only people would just wear the mask, follow the rules, everybody would be fine. This right. is their sim sim simplistic answer. We don't need any more simpletons. And then, George, will now, you talk a little closer to your microphone? Surely. Yeah. Copy. Perfect. Yeah. No problem. So, so what we're dealing with, once again, are behaviors that are consistent with the, the shame-based identity uh -huh. now 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 what is what is shame based you see you see shame is a very healthy human emotion it lets us know that we can and will make mistakes that we have limits that we have boundaries within our beings we know how to use those boundaries our mental physical emotional spiritual and moral boundaries are very important right now why are they important because a person with good boundaries is a good listener and a good learner Naturally, with people who demonstrate having weak boundaries, they're not very good listeners, and they're definitely not very good learners. Right. And they wreak a lot of havoc and a lot of confusion in people's lives. We don't need any more havoc and confusion today. What we need is compassion. We need understanding. We need people to ask the right questions. We need people to have the very discipline today of doing the right research. See, with some discipline, some problems get solved, and with total discipline, most problems get solved. Scott Peck said this in his book, The Road Less Traveled, that discipline is the basic set of tools that we need in order to deal with most of life's complex situations, interpersonally, professionally, inwardly, outwardly. Discipline. Without discipline, we don't have those boundaries. So now it's kind of this sense of lawlessness. I make it up as I go along. I do things just because I can. Self will run riot. I just do things because I can. I drink because I can. Uh, uh, I drug because I can. I just do things because I can. You see, the w self will has run riot. When right. you have a person shame based, they're split inside. 
There's one part over here and another part over there, and they're at war with one another. Then they project that war. We're seeing a lot of this in the lockdowns. Grocery stores, hair salons, malls, people getting attacked, shamed and abused, ridiculed, humiliated and contempted everywhere. This is not adult behavior. This is the thinking of the child. The one that's magical, the one that's yearning for fulfillment, has a shame-based identity that hasn't the strength of proper boundaries to relate to people. See, healthy shame is the permission to be human, which means I can and will make mistakes. As I said, it's also the ability to build interpersonal bridges with other people. And right now, the last thing we need to do in this kind of a situation in our country is to start breaking the interpersonal bridge. We need each other. We need to support each other. But if I have a shame-based identity, I'm not available. I'm not available to be a support to you. Yeah, I mean, this is amazing as I'm hearing you talk because all of this division that's going on, it's just mind-boggling. The racial division and the political divisions that are happening seem like a huge part of it. In fact, a very necessary part of it in order to continue this division is the prevention of people from getting together and having real uh, valuable conversations that can, so they can actually understand each other on this adult human emotional level like you're talking about. And instead, it's like you've got these two sides and they're just screaming at each other. You know, you're listening to misinformation. No, you're listening to misinformation, but no actual conversation about the information that each one, you know, let's, <laughs> let's have a conversation and a debate about what information we've seen and let's figure out together what information maybe is correct and so we can all make a worldview together uh, instead it's just this this outrageous division and what you're saying is that this kind of divisive behavior is going to happen in a in a shame-based culture essentially if all of us have experienced a, 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 this trauma bond that that we discuss with the government then when the government places us in a situation where we feel frightened like there's a race riot or there's a pandemic going on and all we're getting is this fear, fear, fear messaging, then that's going to trigger all of these shame-based responses. Well, of course. I mean, let, let's deal with what you said in the earlier part of your, of your statement. Uh, this division, re remember, divided people create division. I talked about the split. Uh -huh. The other part over there, they're at war with one another. Then you project that war onto other people. You call them jerks. You call them, you know, POSs or whatever the label. Fascists, right? Yeah. <laughs> Fascists, you know, sheeps, whatever. Wh right. Whatever the label, whatever the label, we're no longer dealing with what the subject matter is. We're dealing with who a person is. When I call somebody a jerk or you hear somebody call label somebody a, another name, they're no longer dealing with the issue that caused them to behave that way. Right. They're basically dealing with who the person is, not what the person did. Right, just like the term conspiracy theorist, calling somebody a conspiracy theorist, and then these become ad hominem attacks. Log there's a logical fallacy for you, just exactly like you described. Logic is out the window now. We're just calling each other names, and we're not you know, having adult, rational, reasonable conversations. It, it, well, if people agree that a conspiracy theorist is one who questions the statements of known liars, mm -hmm. then I think I've made the club. Yeah, <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, a, a lot of people that were shaming us with these statements, pathologizing us as conspiracy theorists, not ever knowing its origin, are basically repeating these phrases like loyal parrots. Uh -huh. Remember, mystification adopts the phrases of others. These are not originals. These are hand-me-down statements. There's contagion in these an emotional contagion and people begin to adopt these statements as if they're absolute gospel fact. Well, they're not. They're basically opinions parading around as facts. Mm -hmm. I tell people you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. The opinions that we do see that people are often spouting as facts and touting as facts are mostly made in the spirit of shaming attitudes and behavior toward other individuals. So these people are acting more than human, shameless, perfect. We know it all. We're in control. We're judgmental. 
Right. You know, we're, 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 we're going to put down everything in you. We can't accept in ourselves. I've seen uh, a lot. I mean, well, I've just, I've seen a lot of this language in terms of the mainstream media coverage of the election where, I mean, I was listening to NPR just this morning and you know, the host who's doing the interview is just plainly calling people who believe that perhaps the election was stolen. They're liars. They're liars. There's no information. There's not, you know, and, and these, these blanket statements reminds us of these conversations, reminded me of these conversations that we're having. Like, you know, some people have a different opinion than you and just calling them a liar without actually having a debate, without looking at their point of view and, you know, describing your point of view and having a conversation, it was really uh, almost shocking to me that this guy would come out on a national news venue like that and just call people who disagreed with his opinion liars. Well, it's interesting because the degree to which and the speed to which a person is available to label you is actually a reflection of the degree to which it belongs to them. Mm Mm-hmm. You see, no matter what the trait is that you regard in another person, whether that trait's positive or negative is not relevant. Whatever trait that you, uh, you know, project onto another person, whether it's positive or negative, it's to that degree the trait exists in you, no matter how much of a nice girl or a guy I appear to be. So let me clarify. The, the, um, uh, the the greater your reaction to a trait is in another person, the more fervor behind the label. It's to that degree it exists in you. So if I say, you're a duck. Start looking for my feathers. Right. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with you. And the statement that begins in you, your, <clears throat> pardon me, you are, Every statement that begins in the word you is me putting distance <clears throat> between me and the responsibility I have for making the statement. Uh-huh. Hence, I try to place it in your lap. So you'll see where like people will say, where, you know, where did you get that idea from? You see, where did you get the idea that I was a duck? Right. Well, it had to originate from you. Because I'm standing here, I never expected to think of myself as a duck. Clearly, you think of me as a duck. So where did that come from? You. Yeah. You are a duck. See, it originates from the person's mind. And the one with the problem is the one with the power. If you raise the issue, you've got the power. Mm -hmm. And anytime you deny that, you disclaim even further parts of yourself. Because you're basically showing a disapproval for what you're doing. If you're self-accepting and you, you, you're you okay with what you're doing, you're going to be okay owning it, not disowning it, because it's truly you. But people tend to disown and project onto other, onto other people the parts of themselves they disapprove of the most. Yeah, and that's absolutely. what the shame-based identity does. They give in to those impulses. Well, of course, they have to. Because being flawed and defective or feeling like you're split is a painful state to live in. You want out of it as quickly as possible. Well, what's the best way to get out of it? Give it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Pass the hot potato. With all kinds of characterological styles of defenses, like denial and minimizing and theorizing and you this and you that, people are spitting out indictments toward each other daily, and they don't know that what they're really teaching the listeners is about themselves, not about the other person. They're actually demonstrating who they are in attacking or shaming or discounting or controlling or, or, or uh, uh, trying to belittle the people who seem and feel that they have knowledge about these lockdowns, their ineffectiveness, the harm and injury it's causing families, the spousal abuse, the overdoses, the suicides, everything's up and everyone's going, well, that's COVID. Right. And the other side says, no, it's not. Well, the other side says, well, you're a sheep. See, planet COVID is very argumentative. There's no, <laughs> there's no real information being shared because people aren't attacking the problem. They're attacking the person. Right. And then the argument devolves into gaslighting where... 
you got some real information. Like they can always come up. You're having an argument. You're having an argument. They can always come up with some like I, I mean I, I don't know want to call it necessarily an excuse, but maybe it is an excuse or you know it's a reason that's couched. Well, people are getting sick. You know we have a problem. Um, but in, instead of a logical argument, it's this confusing, bizarre argument where information and misinformation is getting thrown at each other and nobody's really actually paying attention and listening. Um, I guess, you know, it would be called sophistry, actually. That's the word that I'm looking for, where we end up having these long arguments where goalposts get shifted and people you know, uh, manipulate the information that they're getting so that it, it only serves their side. Um, people aren't open-minded. They're not listening. And and most of all, they're not just allowing other people the freedom to have a difference of opinion, you know? I mean, well, well, then you, you know, you, you go back to the issue of boundaries. Once again, you see uh, there's in order for there to be meaningful exchanges, people must care about the goal of the exchange. If they don't care about what they're saying to somebody and they've lost true concern for self-esteem. Well, that's what shame-based people do uh -huh. in interpersonal settings. There is no real aim. The aim is to get out of the shame, not to have an, a meaningful exchange with you. Remember, you're being used to get out of the shame. You are the mood-altering tool of the time, of the day, of the conversation. You're being used to mood alter that person's shame. So if the person's primary objective is to get out of the pain their shame is causing them, naturally they're going to give up the concern for caring about goals and what their, what their truer motives and aims are. These uh -huh. kind of impulses are not about creating uh, uh, healthy exchanges and meaningful conversation, especially during a, a lockdown process that's driving everybody crazy if they're wanting to vent their own frustrations and scapegoat somebody else and make them responsible for how they feel. This is a person with low self-esteem. I mean, bullies and people who want to use others as their emotional punching bags aren't about preserving the integrity of such healthy exchanges. If their true interest is about acquiring knowledge that can help to explain their existence and the current circumstances better, well, everyone would be interested in that, but nobody is interested in being attacked, ridiculed, humiliated, shamed, discounted, and, and brushed aside or ostracized just because somebody can't handle their own identity issues. Right. But it's common. As, and we're seeing more of it. We're seeing this divide because it's, it's almost this anarchy of it's a, a me against you. you know, everybody knows that united you stand, divided you fall. When your back's up against the wall, you got to stick together, show that kind of unity and commitment. Now you've got strength. Everybody knows that. But for the very thing they wish, they do not do. Yeah, I mean, it's it's phenomenal. I want to go back to what you said about the person with the power is the person with the problem and extrapolate this out into this concept of government. Clearly, the government has the power. <laughs> well, let's get that straight. That's It's the person with the problem. The pro one with the problem is the one with the power. Right, right. The one with the problem is the one with the power. So we see in this instance, the government being the one... Uh, well, I mean, I think the psychology of of this kind of government totalitarianism, this authoritarian bent, which all governments, many governments around the world, are now imposing through lockdown. Uh, I mean, this kind of this kind of uh, uh, you know house arrest that's happening practically around the world right now is clearly an authoritarian move. No matter what you think uh, about how to deal with the pandemic or whatnot. I mean, governments are, are drunk with power right now. And so, you know, it's interesting then, and then the people, if we look at it instead of, uh, you know, the, the, the COVIDs versus the, the, or the lockdowns proponents versus the non-lockdowns or the Republicans versus the Democrats or uh, these racial divisions that are affecting the people and instead make the divide between the government and all the people who should be unified against this kind of behavior if they truly have concern with their community, you know, their community members, uh, I mean, with themselves, with their family. I mean, what's going to happen here in the future uh, when the kind of government surveillance, well, the total authoritarianism that we're looking at is coming down the pike? So the people behind the government power, uh, you know, I just I guess I wish that we could do this instead of dividing and conquering the people. Can we understand that it's the the people behind the government drive for power are the ones with the problem here <laughs> well again you're seeing a government that's very dysfunctional 
Mm-hmm. They're permissive. Permissive parenting is absent, indulgent, neglectful, and resistant. We're seeing our governments parent our country exactly that way. So when we filter this once again through the dysfunctional family model, look at the government as one great big giant dysfunctional family that is currently conditioning society with rules that are 200 years out of date. Mm Mm-hmm. That they're still using discounting, judgmentalism, shaming, and controlling. And lockdowns, I will contend, are shaming and abusive and controlling. Absolutely. They're absolutely abusive and absolute power absolutely corrupts. So naturally, people are feeling invaded and shamed by this. Their angers are growing. They want to retaliate. Well, since the anger that they are developing and, and, and accumulating is forbidden in its expression to the government. Well, what do you do with that? Right. Well, you give it to your spouse, you give it to society, you give it to a ball of scotch. Right. But don't direct it at the source because right now you're dependent upon that source for your very survival. So how can you express discontentment with the people who are actually forcing you to become dependent upon them, who will have you relinquish your free speech and your rights to speak out about how you feel about what they're doing to you. I mean, I I can't see any five-year-old packing uh, packing their bags, five-year-old calling a family meeting, dad, I'm angry at you. You're an alcoholic mom. You're a codependent. I'm moving down to Smith's house. Right. (laughs) Right. They were ready to do that. And we can't, and how does that register today? How does that manifest today? We don't see people standing up going, you know what? I'm fed up with this government. Government, I'm done with you guys. We're going to hold you fully accountable. I want to have a meeting at the table with our citizens and tell you guys why we're angry at you. And if you don't quit what we're doing, we're moving the U.S. Yeah. They're not going to do that. People are afraid to stand up for what's really going on behind their eyeballs because they're afraid of repercussions. They're afraid of being found out. They're afraid of being wrong. So, you know, again, the people who act like they're being attacked are telling us that they're afraid of being wrong. And our government is in that position. They don't want the people to be attacked. Right now, they're treating us like hungry dogs in the basement. As things intensify in the U.S. climate, we start seeing that they tighten the noose around Canadian citizens' necks. Mm -hmm. We've seen this. As things worsen, as things get more intensified in the states we're seeing greater measures to keep us from uprising through these lockdowns again shaming and abusive you don't have a right to fear your feelings your thoughts the government's going to decide for you what your response should be to these lockdowns they're going to decide that for you in advance this is on the plan you don't get a say in the matter they're writing the script for you and if you don't like it if you don't like the narrative and if you speak out about it we have another measure for you Maybe we'll arrest you. Maybe we'll fine you. Maybe we'll jail you. Our prime minister just said that the other day, that, you know, there'll be fines and jail jail terms. See, they've upped the ante. They've conditioned us. They kept getting encroaching closer and closer. They've gradually diminished our freedoms, especially our freedom of speech. So naturally, that is shaming and abusive. When you shame somebody enough, expect, expect, that they're going to uprise. They're, I'm sorry, they're going to rise up. They're going to rise up against the totalitarianisms, against the despoticism, the control mechanisms being used, the psychological warfare that is being used to manipulate people into maintaining their fears sufficient to the degree that they will maintain compliance. You know, I, w- I want to go back and talk about what you were saying about anger, because I think that repressed anger, I mean, this is fascinating to think about just in terms of actually trying to unite, trying to understand instead of having a conflict lockdown versus anti-lockdown, I mean, the lockdown proponents, according to this interpretation, one way of looking at it is that the lockdown proponents are angry at their government, just like the anti-lockdown protesters are. Yes. Instead of engaging in fighting with the fighting the government because there's so much pressure not to attack the authority figure and you and people feel shame that and the anger is repressed yeah. you're not allowed to express anger when you were five years old and you were mad at your alcoholic father you didn't have the power 
this got ingrained in your personality. Now you're an adult and you've got the government treating you uh, in, in this abusive fashion, but you've got these repressed feelings that are ingrained. You're feeling anger towards the government, but instead of having the conversation with the government saying, hey, you can't treat us like that, you're lashing out at the anti-lockdown anti, uh, protesters and proponents or you know people that disagree with the government narrative and just saying you know shh, shh, shh. if you just stay quiet then this would all go away if you would just appease the abusive father figure then then this would all go away only it doesn't go away you know that's not how to heal your father's alcoholism right <laughs> i mean well yeah wishful thinking is another part of denial mm -hmm. remember we said denial's not a river in egypt it's an ego defense. <laughs> yeah. When denial comes in, it's like a mirage in the desert. And there's all kinds of forms of denial, minimizing, theorizing, analyzing, dissociating, distract predictions, stay busy so you don't get the necessary feedback. There's all kinds of ways to mood alter shame and to minimize the pain and discomfort. Remember, shame is painful. You want out of it as quickly as possible. Now, if it is not a physical escape, it could be a verbal escape, it could be an emotional escape, but one way or the other, the human being seeks to be free of stressors that interrupt freedom. And when people feel trapped, even though much of being trapped in terms of thinking is an illusion, right now, we are trapped. We're in lockdown. Our freedoms are being taken away. We're seeing oppress, oppression. We're seeing the tyranny. We're hearing it in the speech of our leaders, the so-called leaders who are actually taking directions from another source. They're not listening to Canadians. Right. It seems that, you know, Trump is getting a lot more, uh, you know, attention for what he's saying than Canadians are giving to Trudeau. But I believe the reason for that is Trudeau is on the opposing side of Trump. Thinking more like the leftists. Right. Who are actually the ones doing this divide. I mean, everything they've done is try to, you know, make Trump look bad. They let the people in the White House the other day. The police did. We have video footage of that. We have actual co concrete evidence that the police cooperated with Antifa to let them in, and everyone's going, look what Trump did. Yeah. And now people are just exploiting this garble online that he got impeached twice. When he didn't get impeached twice, he got, they, if you want to call it impeachment, he got impeached once. First time it didn't fly, but people are saying he impeached twice. You see, this narrative, this inflating narrative in the absence of true and fact-based information, the manufacturing process from these shame-based people must live on. They use these narratives that are highly questionable. They're notable for exaggerating facts and inflating uh, circumstances void of facts in the absence of facts. Yeah, I mean, again, and even positing that uh, the left-right paradigm itself is not that there's is not about uh, the authority figures having these conversations in Congress or the politicians talking back and forth and having this divide, but that there may even be, you know, I think lots of evidence shows uh, groups of of billionaires, very wealthy people. Uh, above them manufacturing this divide the you know these are the guys i think uh that are promoting the lockdowns to increase their own wealth and power and and using the whole government structure as just a kind of a a front i mean in my personal opinion i think it's this upper class that's using the left right divide even in our political leaders um yes. to to manufacture these crises in order to trigger the population into this kind of uh, fear-based situation, which then is going to create even more division, which of course then just gives more money and power to the upper classes. Um, it's just fascinating uh, how they're able to do that and then get the people to fight with each other because once they're triggered uh, and they're not listening to each other and they are shame-based, 
then it's just over for the people. We're not, we're not, instead we're shaming each other instead of actually having the conversation with the abusive father figure, it, breaking through the government even and figuring out how to talk to the billionaire class and say, guys, you can't treat us like this anymore. You know, <laughs> I mean, they're not, they're not listening. See, yeah. You see, you got to remember no matter what a mystified shame based person uh, sees, hears, feels, or needs, they feel some degree of shame. You see, this stuff is rooted in, in shame binds, toxic shame binds that uh -huh. are imprinted in the brain, the seed of the memory, the, the uh, amygdala. That is where the content lives. That When a situation that, was, that resembles what's stored in the memory, when that occurs, it guides the response. So when you talk about oppression and the abusive father figure, remember, after a person has been conditioned with shame, this is all conditioning. Masks are conditioning. There's no RCTs, no scientific proof that masks work, but they're forcing everybody to wear them. You see, if we can get you to wear them, yeah. that's a nod. That's a nod. Yeah. You're, you're in compliance. You've agreed with the agenda. Good job, folks. Right. The, and then if you don't wear one, <clears throat> you have what's called a shame bind. You're shamed for it. After you get the shame, it's like, whoa. I'm not going to do a not wear the mask anymore. I'm not going to the grocery store and I'm, I'm not going to do a not wear the mask. Okay. Yeah. Cause, cause that's going to get me shame. And, and every one of those that collates together, every time you are, you are shamed, you, you develop a bind. And then all of those events collates together, like one big hodgepodge of a shame based event, all born of very similar attributes and in interpersonal uh, uh, attitudes that you have internalized unknowingly. And then you start going, um, I'm not going to the grocery store. I'm going to get shamed if I go there. See, the first couple of times you tolerate it, but you know what? As those shame binds thicken, yeah, it reduces the likelihood of your leaving that couch to go to the grocery store. So you eat a bag of chips rather than going and getting a salad just to avoid the shaming. <laughs> right. You see? You know, so this is... This is the psychological warfare is, right. is all there. Well, we're continuing actually to be traumatized. Like, you know, the first step towards healing is to stop the, the trauma. <laughs> I mean, it's very challenging to heal when you're actually participating in an abusive relationship. It's, it's, you can't heal from your addiction issue if you're still indulging in the addiction. You have to quit. Well, and then you you're right. Heal. And so actually being involved in this situation where we're in an abuse, this abusive relationship, because, you know, it's it really dawning on me now. I mean, if I go to the grocery store, if I get too close to someone, I'm not wearing a mask. Clearly, they're they're scared out of their minds, like even getting close to someone that I don't know right now. Because and there's less. I mean, talk about the mass, but the the social distancing concept is even there's. I don't think there's any peer reviewed studies whatsoever about social distancing. Like, we haven't uh, even had this conversation. But it's just from, you know, from my information, it was well, a high school students, uh, you know, project twenty years ago, and now they're just imposing it on everyone. And it, all it does is separate us. And now we're scared of the other, and we're continuing. Well, that's the goal, the, right? That's the goal. They want to keep us. Like I said before, hungry dogs in the basement and the hungrier they get, the more you got to guard them, the more rambunctious they start to get. We got to watch them or keep an eye on them dogs. Yeah. They're going to bite us at any time. Okay. Throw more measures at them. Tighten the noose. Right. Tighten the leash. You see hungry dogs in the basement. And believe me, in my opinion, anyways, don't believe me. I think this is a deliberate strategy. This is not something that is just, you know, sure. uh, external effect of something. No, they're not even putting out the same economic or stimulus packages that they once did. Yet we're in a worse scenario. When things were better, they gave us more. Things are worse, they're giving us less. Right. This isn't making T sense. Tightening the noose, shortening the yes, loose. exactly. That's where the tightening the noose is. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you've got psychological warfare, economic warfare, social warfare, societal breakdowns, relational breakdowns. Th th that that's no accident. Yeah. For a virus where that's killed less people than suicide has lately. I mean, this is not adding up at all. So clearly people are becoming awake to these narratives, these, these, these mathematics 
are absolutely not sensible. They have no scientific basis. Science is something you can debate and it makes sense. Here, we don't have a debate. Yeah. Science is something you can debate. There are arguments that are allowed to be had. There's no, nobody listening to an argument here. Our own governments aren't listening to us. They're taking direction from Davos, I guess, or the World Economic Forum. That's what it looks like to me. Yeah. I mean, what's Klaus Schwab doing? What's his book doing on the desk of all of our mayors? Right. <laughs> everyone's, everyone's got the same recipe. You can't tell one. Well, in Canada, you can't tell one province apart from the next. They're all playing by the same shame-based set of rules. Yeah. They have lost their identity. All right, George, we are knocking on that uh, half hour mark. And I just want to conclude, uh, you mentioned the bullying by shaming. And so maybe we ought to wrap it up by just revisiting that concept again, because, you know, we're trying, what we're trying to do is heal people so we can have rational conversations about how to move forward. And I mean, it's, it's my experience that this, feeling of being bullied by being shamed is is really prevalent and there's a lot of passive aggression that's going on uh, by by really both sides against the other side actually when we both need to just take a step back really focus on healing ourselves so we can make sure that we're not projecting our own crap on everybody else <laughs> which right, is really hard to do we, um, we've got to understand that bullying and shaming have the same goal in mind mm -hmm which is to shut you down, to, to gain power over you. So the reason why I say shaming is a form of bullying, which it is, is because it doesn't make the invitation for people to be human with one another. It creates the invitation for adversarialism, emotional attacks, emotional abuse, social discord, shames, Toxic shame's aim is divide. Mm -hmm. Remember, people are divided. They will create division. If they're whole and complete, they will create wholeness and completeness. Remember, complete, sorry, incomplete people come out of wanting to get. Complete people come out of wanting to give. There is no bully. It is the incomplete person who resorts to shaming behaviors and attacks and this kind of bullying is meant to make them feel powerful as though they are aligned with their original offenders perceiving such offender or themselves rather as having the same power their offenders once had that's called identification with the persecutor so when people begin to do that that's all mood altering it's all an illusion so if people want to heal that part of it let's understand that shame-based people are not powerful they're expressing exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. They're showing us in their conduct just how powerful and insecure they truly are. After all, if I feel okay as a person and I'm confident, I want you to feel the same way. I want you to have the same personal power that I have within me. I have enough. I can share it with you. Right. Healthy relationships are about shared power, not for shame-based bullies. They want to overpower you because they feel underpowered within themselves. Right. And then maybe one more comment again about the boundaries, because a healthy person, when confronted with this kind of shame-based attack, knows how to, at the very least, not allow it to, to you're not going to feel like you're attacked. You're all right. Like, you can shame me all you want. I have my opinions. I'm confident with myself. Uh, I, you don't need to hurt me emotionally. And then learning how to deal with the shame without then getting triggered yourself into attacking back, attacking back. I mean, this is okay, what we really let, want to prevent, right? Let's make the clear distinguishing uh, uh, position here. A person who is being shamed can't not feel hurt by it, especially if it's somebody by somebody who you have a, a, a strong bond with. Yeah. It's hard to imagine not being hurt by what somebody says to you if you're right. not bonded to do them to them in a valued way. If you're not if you're not bonded to them in a valued way, well, fully on you. Who cares what you say? Yeah. Right. But but shaming has its strongest impact between people who have an important relationship together who are bonded. Now, I know it's hard to imagine that we see people who've been married for 20 years or 25 years shaming each other, but there's a very relevant function there, too. They're teaching one another that they're still 
living in childhood. They haven't mm-hmm. broken the bonds. They haven't broken the rules of the family rule book. At 52 or 55 or 60 years old, they're sw- still swinging the Hatfields versus the McCoys. Uh, <laughs> right. right. Who's right. going to win out? Whose power, whose rules are going to win out, right? So so it's the Hatfields versus the McCoys. And this is what resembles shame-based relationships. I got to get you no matter what the cost. I'm going to defeat you because it's not about shared power anymore. It's about regaining power. Yeah. If I've already regained my power, I can share it. But if I'm still in the process of reclaiming power and you try to come and take power from me, well, I'm going to fight you. I'm going to get very defensive because I don't have enough power for you to come and take, is the child is saying. <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, yeah. you know who do you think you are? So, so w- when people have enough power, th- they're not easily shamed. They understand where it's coming from. They don't take it personally. And they understand that the shaming person has a problem. So if you want to heal yourself with a person who is shame-based and they're not interested in healing themselves just yet, all you can tell yourself is don't take it personally. It has nothing to do with you. Don't waste your time getting into it with anybody who is attacking you because where there's attacking, skills are lacking. Absolutely. All right. Well, sounds good, George. We better cut it. I know we could talk as always for hours, especially about this subject. It's so important. I think we got a lot of really important information out uh, to the public and I hope people can, you know, as this series progresses, it's really starting to come together for me, uh, how these psychological triggers work on people. I think we need to actually keep in mind that that those who are, let's say, skilled at psychological operations – uh, and I know it's it's hard for people in these quote unquote Western democracies to imagine that uh, an intelligence agency may be do you know may be engaging in psychological operations against uh, uh, our free societies. But people who do this kind of thing are very skilled at this psychology that we're talking about. So you know <laughs> the idea yeah. that that maybe someone they- is using these tools against us, and if we're we remain ignorant of this fact. Uh, it really leaves us open to be manipulated. No question. You wouldn't have the behavior if you didn't have the problem. The symptoms are there, and we're seeing the results from their existence. Yeah. So, you know, people can debate all day whether whether it's here or it isn't. All we have to do is take a look at how society is functioning today, how people are functioning in their relationships, uh, how well they're doing uh, in, uh, in their inner lives. I mean, we're seeing a lot of depression. We're seeing a lot of issues around uh, uh, drugs and dr- uh, increases in drinking. Mm-hmm. So, so naturally people are trying to find the escape hatches in the very outlets I spoke of earlier to mood alter the discomfort that they're in. Now, if we can just get rid of the shame and start dealing with reality, we would start seeing people feeling much better. It's much safer to live in reality than it is to deny it. You cannot right. outrun you're not going to outrun this. Yeah. <laughs> you can't outrun reality. That's for sure. No. Turn around <laughs> and face it. And yeah. we'll just get, we'll get into that and why people will prolong this next time in our next episode, Doug, under the uh, trans-like existence. Okay, uh, great. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the numbing effects of, 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 of these other traits, magical yearning for fulfillment and being shame-based in the next episode. Awesome. Trans-like existence next week. That was going to be my final question. And uh, so uh, do you want to tell people how to uh, get in touch with you or your organization, where to go to, to find out more about the line and what you're up to? As always, hit up the line, Canada.com at the line media on Twitter and the line Canada on Twitter as well. You can also catch us on Facebook at the line Canada, any questions, any concerns or comments regarding uh, the production uh, that uh, Doug has been leading here uh, for the line, please get me at media at the line international. Dot com. I'm I'm very thrilled to hear your opinions, your thoughts, any questions that you have. I've received some. I'm always happy to receive more. Great. And I'll just let people know if you're listening to this and you like what you're hearing, you can find it all at www.theshiftnow.com under uh, free content. You'll see the Psychology of Lockdown series there and you can catch uh, all of them as they come out. 
Uh, I'm also on social media on Facebook and YouTube at The Shift with Doug McKinty, and I'm on Twitter at D McKinty. But uh, I do urge people to go to the website, theshiftnow.com, sign up for the newsletter, uh, and I'll send you uh, all of my new productions as they come out so you can stay up to date. All right. Thanks, everybody, for, for listening. And thank you, George, for talking about this. I think this is a really important conversation. Uh, I hope we can get the word out with this with this stuff, because I think that the more people who understand how psychology works and how this psychology works, the more the, the faster we can get over all of this divisiveness, start improving our listening skills, stop all of this irrational back and forth from, from these triggered fight or flight responses that we're all having under, under these stressful times uh, and start to uh, heal ourselves and heal our community so we can move forward in a, in a rational uh, and emotionally healthy way. So thank you so much. And we'll do it again next week. Looking forward to it. Thanks a million, Doug. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy the series. Yeah, you bet. Have a great day.